Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. Our guest today is Dan Russell, professor of philosophy at the Center for the Philosophy of Freedom at the University of Arizona. Today we're going to be talking about an essay he has coming out in an upcoming collection called The Handbook of Virtue Ethics in Business and Management. This essay is about questions of how much we ought to work, what trade-offs there are in terms of earning more money versus having more time and how we ought to think about those sorts of things. So Dan, you begin by saying that business ethics because this is this is an essay for – on business ethics needs to expand what it means by the term ethics beyond its typical focus on just ethical dilemmas. But isn't, isn't that what ethics is about though? Isn't – when we talk about ethics, we're talking about facing moral quandaries, figuring out how we should solve moral conundrums or is it more than that? Well, that certainly is one of the things that it's about. Uh, and that's a very important thing. I mean, life presents all kinds of uh, challenges, and there there are uh, there, there are things that new uh, activities and industries and possibilities open up uh, for thinking about what's the right thing to do that people haven't uh, had to face before. Um, and so that makes it important for there to be a, you know continuing ongoing reflection uh, on the uh, on ethics as as it pertains to things like you know conundrums and, and dilemmas. But that certainly isn't all that there is to it. And in fact, if you think about uh, about ethics the way, for example, Aristotle did, then that could only be a very small part of it, and actually not the part that you start with. The term ethics actually comes from a Greek word that derives from uh, their term for uh, for character or being a certain kind of person. So in that context, uh, when people like Aristotle or Plato talked about Ethics, they meant the things having to do with character and the things having to do with who you are and what kind of person you are. And so on that perspective, ethics doesn't just sort of fall in your lap as something you're suddenly presented with because there's this bizarre dilemma that you've got to sort out. Uh, it starts because, you know, at some point you're reflective enough to realize that you've got a life ahead of you and uh, not everything is outside of your control in terms of, you know, what things you do and even what things you want to do. Uh, those are things we make choices about as well. And so on. I wanted to, in, in this paper, expand uh, ethics in, in this rather uh, sort of ancient Greek way and think uh, instead of, you know, in, in a very traditional approach to business ethics, you take some quandary and, uh, and, and give different sides of it. And I thought, well, that's fine, but I would like to look at, uh, at something more, not just what people do at work, but what they do about work. And what place they give it in their lives overall. So this the essay is about the unexamined costs of earning extra income. That's this this question about work and how it fits into our lives. So let's start there. What sorts of things do we give up when we take opportunities to earn more money? Well, I called the paper "When Does Income Cost Too Much," and I I did that you know knowing that the uh, that the title would sound at first. A bit paradoxical. Well, no, income is the thing that pays. How could income cost? But of course, it does. And whether income is measured in uh, in money that you get from uh, an employer, or from investors, or whether it's measured in you know in terms of the things that you yourself have produced or gathered or traded for at the end of the day, it does cost something. Um, one thing that it costs pretty clearly is it costs time. Uh, it um, in order to have an income, again, whether it's in money or whether it's in good goods, it takes a lot of time to do the things that make it possible to uh, to acquire to acquire that wealth. It takes energy, uh, which means that uh, you know things that you uh, things that you might have spent your day doing and things that you might have given your your energy to are now un- unavailable to you. And it also involves your uh, your attention. And you know just how full your mind is, and, and how how many ways you can divide what you're able to think about and concentrate on, and really you know sort of sort of give your attention to. So, income uh, costs us a lot of opportunities to do other things with our time, with our energy, and with our attention. Now, obviously, sometimes devoting time, energy, and attention to the earning of income is uh, the use of that of that time and so on that we value the most because we we really need that income. 
But there can come a point uh, beyond which maybe it's not worth it anymore, and maybe there are more more valuable al- alternative uses of those uh, of those very personal resources um, besides just putting them into earning more money. But of course, knowing exactly where that point is uh, and knowing what it would take. Um, you know what kinds of what kinds of circumstances are there that that go into defining where that point is? Those are kinds of interesting questions, and those are some of the things I wanted to explore. Yeah, I mean they're they're interesting. They're also just very difficult questions. I mean, I think a great many of us wrestle with those sorts of questions constantly, or related things about should I go into the job market now? Should I get more schooling so I can earn more later? Should I? take this promotion if it pays a bit more but I don't think I'd like the work as much. Like these are these are not easy questions to solve um, and they're, they're really personal questions. So how do – I mean the Greeks were living, Aristotle was living quite a long time ago in a, in a world <laughs> that looked very different than the one that we live in today. So how does, how does he of all people help us – Think about these sorts of questions. Yeah, that's good. I'll, I want to address the first thing you said, which is that you know this is something that we do wrestle with, and I think that's actually uh, part of the good news is uh, is just noticing that uh, that there is something to be given up um, by uh, by earning uh, income or earning higher income at the margins or deciding uh, you know when to put time into. Uh, into income and when to put it off, and really, that's one of the things I wanted to get at in this paper was to was to encourage more of that wrestling and maybe try to give it some uh, some guidance. Uh, but it's something that we see Aristotle talking about as well. Now, as you say, I mean Aristotle, you know, this is someone who was writing about twenty four hundred years ago uh, in a different part of the world in such a different time. You know, it might have been on another planet for all. Uh, for all practical purposes, so there is this question: was so how how could he possibly have uh, have thought about this in a way that was relevant? Well, there are a few things about that. One is that uh, is that ancient Greece turns out to have been wealthier than people have uh, have realized. Uh, there's a there's an excellent uh, body of research uh, by uh, Josiah Ober about this, showing that there was uh, immense. Uh, economic growth in Athens around uh, that, that culminated in uh, around the time of uh, people like Plato and Aristotle, and that uh, um, mean wages there were extremely high. I mean, high enough to rival anything in the uh, in the pre-modern world. And we see Aristotle addressing himself to some of the issues that were arising in a world that was uh, that was changing and that was be that was as economically active as that world. Will as that world was. And so he talks about happiness. And one of the things that he does when he talks about happiness or well-being is he goes over a lot of the really, um, you know, common opinions there are about it. He thinks, you know, some of these opinions are better, some of them aren't so good, but let's at least start with, uh, uh, with what people think. And one of the most common uh, views that he talks about is the idea that the happy life is the life of, uh, of being very wealthy and of making lots and lots of money. Uh, now, he doesn't have a lot of time for this view. It's not because he thinks there's something shabby necessarily about money making, but he thinks that it really is a very fundamental mistake about the nature of uh, money and wealth. Um, the happy life should be something that we want for its own sake and entirely for its own sake. In fact, it's something that we should ultimately want everything else for the sake of. But then, of course, if you think about uh, money or wealth, then it's pretty obvious that 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 can't be ultimate in that kind of way. That's not something that we want uh, for its own sake. It's not something that we want everything else for the sake of. Unless we're now, Scrooge McDuck, yeah, I suppose. Ahead. Unless we're Scrooge McDuck. But well, that's right. And he realizes, of course, that there are some, <laughs> some so, to, so to speak, some Scrooge McDucks in the world. He says there are people who, you know, at least they say that uh, that uh, the ultimate thing to go for in life is. Uh, is is just to make more. Well, how much more? Well, more than more than you have now, and that's something that just never ends. And he finds this a really, really puzzling way of uh, of thinking about life. You know, he doesn't doubt that there are people. Uh, he doesn't doubt for a moment that there are people who genuinely do uh, look at life this way. But he thinks there's something really tragic there because if the goal is is not to have enough but to have more, 
then there's no point at which you could know that it makes sense to stop. And in that sense, uh, you know, the opportunity costs of doing the things that it takes to, uh, to acquire wealth or to earn income, they're just boundless. There's no point at which they stop. And so what ultimately happens is you don't actually end up having had anything that you were really living for. And there's something he thinks deeply, deeply uh, tragic about that. And that's something that he really wants to try to warn people away from. So if, if money, if having money is not happiness and is just a means to happiness, then for Aristotle at least, what is happiness? Right. Well, I, uh, I wrote a book not long ago trying to answer that question, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll, try to, um, I'll try to summarize it. Aristotle thinks that happiness ultimately is a life of activity. He thinks that uh, you know, the, defining, the defining aspect of human nature is not so much that you know, we're just receptacles of pleasure, um, it's rather the idea that we commit ourselves to things and our lives take a shape and our, our characters and our personalities take a shape by the kinds of relationships that we get involved in, the projects that we become interested in, and really the things that we end up giving our life to. And in, in that broad sense, he thinks, well, that's to say that uh, a human life is a life that's engaged in these sorts of activities. We might call them, you know, pursuits or meaningful pursuits. So he thinks that a life, a happy life is one, a life of uh, activity, but two, of course, not just, um, not just any activity. He thinks that it's activity that is guided towards goals that we find important and meaningful for their own right. And not just any goals and not just any kind of activity, but also, um, Activity and goals that are characterized by a kind of human excellence, by characteristics and attributes of oneself as a person that are part of what it is to be a person who's living a flourishing life and who's excellent as a human being. How do we know what those are? I mean, isn't that like – because what you described, like people would say, sure, but figuring out the details of that, figuring out – which characteristics are the ones that constitute or lead to happiness um, and then how much of them and how to weigh them against each other? That's, that's the hard question. So how do we know what those things are? It is. Um, the things that I've, I've been calling excellences, these often get translated as virtues. And there's a real pitfall here because people you know, will read, well, Aristotle says that uh, the most important thing for uh, for happiness is virtuous activity or activity in accordance with the virtues. And they'll think, well, that's an incredibly puzzling thing to say because, well, what are the virtues? Well, the virtues are, yeah, I don't know, I suppose. Um, you know, we think of all kinds of, uh, you know, traditional moral rules and duties and we look at those and we think, well, I guess they have something to do with happiness, but I would have thought what they had to do with happiness was they were curbs on the pursuit of it, right? Pursue your happiness, but uh, don't go over the following boundaries. And that's what the virtues are for. And if we approach it that way, then we find, you know, what he says about happiness to look really strange. Uh, and people often come away thinking, well, I guess he just must not have meant by happiness anything that we mean by happiness. Um, I think that's a bit unfortunate. And I think that that actually gets things backwards. Um, I think for Aristotle, we do better by trying to give a bit of content to the kinds of things that make a good human life, a happy life, and then using that to try to understand what kinds of things are virtues. So what I'm saying is he doesn't start with sort of a, uh, a fixed notion of what the virtues are and then try to, you know, pry them into his account of happiness for some reason. Instead, I think there's an approach to happiness which then leads to a way of understanding, well, what things would count as excellences? So one of the things that, for example, that's uh, very important for happiness is having things that you believe in strongly and acting for the sake of those. Well, if you think about that, that's therefore going to require uh, certain attributes of character, such as you know, not being distracted by things that, uh, that will pull you away or not being put off those things when, uh, when the going gets tough. But that's to say that things like temperance and courage are going to be virtues in a person. And likewise, there are going to be, you know, friends are going to be very, very important. These in close personal relationships are very, an important part of human flourishing on this view. 
But then there are going to be certain excellences that go along with um, being a person who can have friends and being some, someone that other people are going to want to befriend. And so that will, will inform uh, the view of what, of what kinds of attributes and characteristics or virtues as well. I think one thing that may seem troubling about this though, especially when, when we talk about this within the context, we call this all ethics and this is all coming from a, a book by Aristotle that is called The Ethics, um, that that this seems – I mean so you say that a lot of this is you know, happiness is found in having something we believe in and, and acting in pursuit of it. Um, but let's take – I mean let's take the most monstrous example possible of someone like Hitler. Hitler obviously had right. very strong beliefs and he acted to carry those out um, and he, he may have been – I mean he might have told you he was happy doing it. Um, does that mean that he was – Living out the kind of life, and I mean, we could posit. I don't. He had friends, and um, <laughs> but but to say, you know, it would be odd to have a theory that said, well, Hitler was doing things okay. Yeah, that's right. Um, here, there's there's something that's uh, that's important to bring out in in Aristotle's approach that we don't always find in uh, in modern approaches to happiness or to well being. Um, the He's not chiefly trying to trying to say, well, what is it for for me to be happy? Or, you know, pick this person over there. What is what is it for that person to be happy? He's trying to answer a bigger question, and that is, what is human happiness? And those things are very different. So, one example that um, that I've used in in talking about this uh, in another in another place was the example of Robert Crumb, the uh, the cartoonist. Uh, there was a fascinating documentary about Robert Crumb called Crumb, uh, and I watched it a few years ago. And there's a scene in which Crumb was talking with an old girlfriend, and they were filming it. And um, wasn't really sure why they were filming this this conversation. It seemed a bit tangential. But then partway through the conversation, he just happened to let drop to uh, to this old girlfriend that he was never in love with her. And she doesn't know what to say about this. You know, she's, is, are you kidding? You certainly said that you did. And he says, well, I know that I said that I did, but what is, what's your point? And he kind of, you know, backed, backed up for a moment, said, now, wait, don't take this personally. Uh, it's not that I just, I didn't love you. I've never loved anybody. And he goes on. He says, in fact, I don't even get what people are talking about. I don't get that concept. Uh, I don't know what it would be to love somebody. It's a bizarre idea. And so I was watching this and I thought, well, that was, was that just, you know, something outrageous to say for the camera or for somebody else? But then there's a later scene in which uh, they were interviewing uh, Crumb's uh, adult son. And his adult son said, you know, I think, uh, I know that I love my father. I guess that he loves me, but, but I, I wish there was some way that I could show it to him. And he didn't mean anything sentimental. He said, I wish I could shake my father's hand one time in my life, but my dad can't do that. And I sort of realized, wow, that's why I had to see the conversation with the girlfriend. This guy actually meant it. He doesn't get love. So now think about what it is for Crumb to be happy. Well, there are a couple of questions here. One is, okay, well, what's, what's happiness for Crumb? Well, evidently, whatever happiness for Crumb would be, it doesn't involve being in loving relationships. That's just, I mean, that would just be pointless. But nobody would look at that, and, uh, would look at Crumb and say, well, there you go. That's as clear a case as we could ever have of what happiness is. Um, to think of another film, as good as it gets, there's the scene where uh, Jack Nicholson uh, is frustrated with his psychiatrist and he storms up out of the office. And as he passes the waiting room, to let out his frustration. He says the cruelest thing he could possibly think of to say to the other people in the waiting room. He says, what if this is as good as it gets? And if we think about, well, happiness is just what it is for that individual to be happy. And we look at someone like Crumb and we think, well, okay, I guess happiness is whatever happy, happiness is for him. But that sounds a lot more like, well, no, that's as good as it gets if you're Crumb. But as good as it gets can actually be a million miles away from anything that's really good. So maybe we need to think not just, you know, about what this person is like or what they would happen to want and so forth. But maybe we, we need to think more deeply about what is it to be fully human and what is it to be living a life that is really recognizable 
as genuine human happiness. And I think that's where, that's really where Aristotle is coming from. And I think that's why it's, it's much more p- plausible on his view to start with that way of thinking about things and then ask, so, okay, what kind of characteristics do I need to have in order to live that kind of life? Let's bring this back to the the question of the decision to give up time in order to make more income um, and, and talk about how these virtues apply to that sort of question. So you – you mentioned in the paper um, – you say, well, first, that, that, that right now to, to a degree unprecedented in history, most people today have the opportunity of shifting their focus from mere living to living well. Um, and then you, you go on later to say that the challenge at the margin then – so when we're deciding in the moment to whether to give up. Um, a bit of time for a bit more income. So the, the challenge at the margin is therefore to choose with wisdom so that taken all together, your time on this earth will add up to a good life, uh, a life that is lived well. Um, what is – so what is this this wisdom that you're talking about here and how does that – what is Aristotle? How do, does Aristotle have something in particular in mind with the word wisdom? Um, yes. By wisdom, Aristotle means uh, something that acts rather like a skill in that um, it's uh, it's about what to do in the way that skills are, but also that it makes um, a person good at certain kinds of things in ways that you know people aren't just good at by default. Um, but what what wisdom makes a person good at is good at making choices and making decisions. So it's a skill, he says, of uh, of deliberation or of decision making. Now, in some places, he describes it as a skill of finding the mean. Um, you know, people who might know, you know, might have heard two things about Aristotle's ethics might uh, have some vague memory of the golden mean or something like that. Um, the mean in Aristotle is is simply a way of trying to avoid uh, multiple ways. Of getting things wrong, um, and he characterizes these sometimes as well. You can you can go wrong in the area of doing something more than you should, or doing something less than you should. And the idea is to find the mean. Now, he goes on to explain, and I think this is actually really useful in this context. That by the mean, he doesn't mean something in the middle. So, for example, you know, people some sometimes say, "Oh, so Aristotle believed in do, acting in accordance with the mean," and so he thought that meant doing everything in kind of an intermediate way, nothing too much, nothing too little. And uh, that gets a bit absurd when you think about, for example, virtues with virtues having to do with emotions like anger. Um, there, one way to go wrong is to be too angry, or to be angry when you shouldn't, and the, another way to go wrong is. To, not to be angry enough and not to get angry at the things you should. Now, if Aristotle thought that the mean in between these was some sort of halfway point, then absurdly he would hold the view that, so the right way to do is to go around sort of mildly annoyed all the time. Uh, that can't possibly be the idea. So what he meant instead was, no, it, uh, what we're trying to do is find something, is find, uh, is find a point at which you're making, you, you, you're doing what's appropriate with respect to something like anger or, or what the, whatever the case may be. Um, he gives an example to try to illustrate this. He says, think about food, think about a, a diet. Um, we could identify some amount of food that's just too little. Uh, there's nobody who can, who can get through the day on that much food. And then we can get by, we, then we could identify some other amount of food that's too much, right? Nobody would ever need that much food. We wouldn't want to say, so the right amount of food for everybody uh, is found by splitting the difference between those two quantities. Well, of course not, right? That amount of food is going to be st- still too much for some people, still not en- still not enough for others. Uh, rather, the thing to do is try to identify um, what each person actually does need to get through the day and then to, um, to avoid going to either extreme from that point. And that's how he thinks about uh, wisdom uh, as something... Uh, as something that finds the mean. And that's relevant because as we start uh, thinking about choices that are at the margin, 
What's built into this way of thinking about, you know, choosing in accordance with the mean at the margin is a recognition that, well, a wise choice is going to look very different for, for different people. And over time, it's something that could really change and it's going to be heavily dependent on a person's particular uh, circumstances. How do we develop this wisdom though? I mean you, you bring up – you brought up the example of how much is the right amount to eat and that this is different for different people. But a lot of us even acknowledging that it's different for different people have a hard time figuring that one out. Um, so where is – I mean how, how do we make ourselves wise? How do we get to be wise? Where does wisdom come from? Because we're not going to make these decisions well unless we've got it, right? That's right. Um, actually, a chapter or two before he starts talking about the mean, he takes up this question in, in, in kind of a brief way. Um, he makes a comparison between learning to be wise and uh, learning to write or learning, uh, learning to speak a language. By learning to write, I don't mean learning to write, you know, poems or essays. I just mean, you know, learn, <laughs> learning to write when you're, uh, when you're in grade school. Um, he says what people do there is they start off writing. He says you know, there's, it's a bit paradoxical. You learn to write your letters by writing your letters. He says, well, how? If I knew how to write my letters, I wouldn't need to know how to learn how. Says, well, no, it doesn't work like that. When you're... When you're writing your letters as a learner, you're doing it in a learner's way and you, you're following somebody else's guidance. You're maybe relying on certain kinds of rules. Uh, you're looking at what other people do. Right? You have a teacher who gives you an outline and so on and you follow that. But over time, what happens is that you become less dependent on those things. And actually, eventually, you can become uh, quite independent, and you can uh, you can even innovate. You can you might learn to change your mind about the about the right way to do these things. That's what happens in uh, in the acquisition of skill. Um, and he thinks that you know again, this is a, at a very very uh, general sort of level. He thinks acquiring a virtue such as the virtue of wisdom works like this as well. It's something that we learn. Um, we learn it from examples. We learn it by um, trial and error. We learn it by making, uh, making attempts, sometimes failing, sometimes succeeding, sometimes realizing that we don't do things very well and then trying to address that. Um, there's more that we could say here, but that's, that's basically how he thinks about, uh, he thinks about wisdom. That is something that's built up, um, through practice and through, uh, through failure, through imitation, and uh, like uh, like many skills are, and that over time it's something that we become increasingly independent of doing. All of us have a fair amount of experience making decisions throughout our lives, sometimes making good ones, sometimes making bad ones. But even with equal amounts of experience, it seems like wisdom, I guess just like any other skill, is not necessarily evenly distributed. And so to bring this into the question of of government, whether we're talking about the, the amount of food you can eat or the number of hours you should work, wouldn't there be, then be an argument that just like the child who ha is learning his letters has to be – you know, someone has to say this is the correct way to write an A and a B and a C. Mm. Um, wouldn't that mean then there's a role for government to step in and say, OK, this is – the most likely to be correct amount of food to eat or the number of hours to work, you know, so like the way that in the the his, government has a long history of being involved in the number in like work life balance, like the famous Lochner Supreme Court decision about the number of hours bakers could work. Doesn't doesn't this mean there's an opportunity for the government to step in and kind of help the unwise or encourage them, get them started on the right path by kind of restricting their options a bit or showing them the correct way to go? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the, uh, the next question, of course, is always, so if human, in, if human fallibility is the problem, uh, show me how bureaucrats who are humans are the solution. Uh, so, in order for this kind of approach to be uh, some kind of improvement, we need we need some reason to believe, uh, you know, that the people who will be constraining my choices and your choices and our friends' choices and so forth are in a better position to know where the mean is uh, for each of us than we and uh, and the people that we consult are going to be. And I think that's going to be 
going to be a really difficult thing. I mean, as um, well, let's think about some of the choices that people make at the margins uh, and what it is to hit the mean at the margins. So in the paper and sometimes in my class, I introduce these two people. I call them Fred and Frida. And so Fred, let's imagine um, Fred and Frida both, I should say up front, let's, let's assume they both make a, a comfortable living, right? By, by any, anyone's standards in a developed country, we would say, yeah, they're, they're doing fine. So the question is, okay, how much farther uh, should they go in investing time in collecting income beyond that point? In other words, at that margin. So suppose that one of these people, you know, let, let's say that, uh, that Fred is at a point in his life where he has a lot of, uh, he has a lot of family commitments. He wants to spend a lot of time with family. Um, and for someone like that, it could be the case that, you know, at the margin, he has a lot more use for the time than he does for the extra money. Uh, so in a case like that, it, where the mean could really be is at the margin, the thing to do is to try to get some of the time, get some of the time back instead of uh, investing it in yet another block of income. But now move to somebody like Frida, and let's suppose that she's in a very different position in her life. She's in a place where, suppose she doesn't have uh, a family yet. So she's single, um, she's not in a relationship, um, but uh, she does have plans for the future. I mean, perhaps she wants to be able to, uh, to take a more, take fairly relaxing kind of job in the future, or perhaps to retire early, or to set more aside for certain kind, you know, so that she can be, spend more time with family when the time comes. So for her at this point, at that margin, it might actually make a lot of sense for her to uh, invest the next block of time uh, in order to acquire the next block of income. She has a greater use for the income than she does for the, uh, than she does for the free time. So here are two very different people and notice that where the mean is for them is in a completely different place, right? I mean, the, the, for one person, the mean is going to be one kind of choice for somebody else. The mean is going to be the opposite kind of choice. And the thing is, it, it, it doesn't stop there. It can even change over their lives. So, you know, we could imagine maybe 10 years earlier, the thing for Fred to do was to invest more in the margin in income than in free time. Maybe 10 years from now for Frida, the thing to do will be to invest more at the margin in free time than in extra income. So even f so between people, the mean is going to be completely different depending on their different circumstances. And even for the same person, at different times in their life, the mean could be something completely different because those circumstances change. Now, for each of these people, that means that there's a lot of difficulty. There's a lot of wisdom that's needed at any given time to know what's the most sensible choice to make at the margin. But then there's this further question. So how much sense would it make for them to involve other people in those choices at the margin? Well, if those other people are pe other people who know their particular circumstances are invested in their well-being, in other words, if they're the people that know and love them, then that's terrific. Um, those people can, can provide advice and counseling. These could be family members. They could be clergy. They could be therapists. Um, on the other hand, if those people are you know, far away in an office having to draft a policy, um, that's going to be the same for everyone. The problem immediately becomes extremely difficult how that policy is both going to actually do something to constrain people's choices uh, at the margin, but not also um, constrain those choices in ways that actually make it much harder for, for, for Fred or for Frida or maybe for both of them uh, to hit what's the mean in their particular case. So I think that's really the problem that has to be overcome. I thought one of the really interesting parts of the essay was where you say that even if somehow the bureaucrat manages to get it right, manages to set the number of hours or whatever to what you would have decided yourself um, if you had – if you were 
as fully wise as you could be and had all the necessary information that even if the bureaucrat sets the policy to exactly what you would have chosen, that there's still something wrong with that. Yes. So think about a happiness researcher who um, comes up with a theory. I mean, they, they devote their lives to trying to understand what human well-being is and what human happiness is and, uh, and how it, it can be impacted by public policy. And suppose it's a terrific theory and, um, and they publish it and, and, uh, and, it's, and it's very well received and so on. Now consider the fact that they're not the only person who's done that. And so there's going to be um, somebody else who's devoted their life to exactly the same thing and they've got this different view. And then there will be a third person and that person has a different view. Um, for example, in the area of, uh, of happiness research, um, Robert Skidelsky and Edward Skidelsky recently wrote a book, uh, uh, How Much is Enough? And in it, they outline... Um, a view of, of uh, the good life for humans, and the, uh, the the view basically consists of a list of things that uh, that are you know crucial goods in human life, and the list is full of really plausible things. I, I, I'm not that kind of list maker myself, but if I were, I don't know how different it would look to there. However, they also note that there are other people working in the field who've come up with rather different lists. Um, people who don't put all of the same goods on, right? People who put on, who include goods on their list that they don't, people who leave out goods that they insist on putting in. Then there are people who want to assign different kinds of weights between these goods. Okay, well, if I have to choose between good A and good B, then which way does it go? And people, which way do I go? And people can disagree over, over those sorts of things. There can also be disagreements over, well, just how aggressive should, should public policy be about this? Should public policy simply see to it that, that people have opportunities to acquire these goods, but then leave it at that? Or should we actually try to guarantee that people do obtain those goods and they do actually um, uh, make the use of those opportunities that, uh, that we hope they would. And so there are all of these sorts of differences. Um, but then I got to imagining what would it be like then if you took any three uh, people in happiness research and you put them on a desert island. Here I'm, uh, I'm drawing on a thought experiment that I thought was just marvelous from uh, – from a paper uh, called Virtue and Politics that uh, that was published recently by Mark Labar, uh, who I believe has been on the podcast yes. before. Um, Mark ran this uh, this um, thought experiment in his paper. I thought it really fit in this context as well. And the idea goes like this: so you have these you have these three people who uh, who've devoted their lives to trying to understand the nature of well being, and they've come up with these three different views. Now suppose that these three are on this desert island and there needs to be some sort of governance on this desert island. And of course, the governance should be such that it's going to promote the well-being of all of those who are on, uh, who are on this island. Well, that means we need some theory. But whose theory is it going to be? Now, pick any one of those people and suppose that their theory is the one that's going to hold sway on this island. Then think about the perspective of the other two people towards life on that island lived in that way. Now, it's not just so much that, that uh, uh, there's disagreement, but rather each of those other people is going to look at that arrangement and they're going to perceive this as they're living at somebody else's pleasure, at their being asked to allow someone else to make choices and to come up with policies and to, cons to constrain their choices in accordance with a view of the good that may or may not be their own. And I think that's the, really the fundamental issue here is the experience of living at the pleasure and at the discretion of some other person. And that I think raises real questions of, uh, justification. Suppose that we could come up with, um, you know, suppose that we, here, here's a way of trying to solve 
uh, the problem of, of why I think the bureaucrats should be any better than I am at trying to figure out the, the best choice for me at the margin. And the answer might be, well, there are scientists who study these things. Or there are people in the social sciences and in the humanities who study these things. So all we need to do is, uh, is adopt one of those theories and Bob's your uncle. Well, the problem is that if that theory uh, is actually going to constrain my choices, then it means that my life is now going to be shaped and my choices are now going to be constrained at the pleasure of somebody else. And that's a question of what we can justify to each other in terms of how we act with respect to each other through political mechanisms. Right. And I think that's I mean, I think that's an important point because we want to I mean, we what we don't want it to sound like you're saying is all of us therefore ought to make these decisions in a vacuum, you know, wholly independently. That those all of those those scientists and philosophers and whoever else may be very wise people, and it may I mean it would be in our interest to seek out their advice. But I think what I hear you saying is then ultimately I mean we can we can learn from them, we can take the advice. But what's important is that ultimately the the final decision is our own. I think that's right. I mean, one thing that Aristotle saw that I think was very insightful was how deeply social. Uh, human beings are. So, I mean, I talked earlier, well, what is it, what is it that's really definitive of, uh, of human nature and therefore what's really crucial to human flourishing? And for him, our social aspect was, uh, was part of that, that we um, were not solitary animals. Like, is this what uh, he meant when he called us, a, when he said man is a political animal? Yes, in in uh, the politics, he describes, uh, he says, you know, a human being is a political animal. And I think that was incredibly insightful, although I'm not sure it contains exactly the inf- insight that, uh, that, that some think that it does. What he had in mind there uh, was to say that man is the kind of, the kind of animal um, whose distinctive mode of living involves living in a polis or in a city-state. Uh, a city-state is, um, is for him defined, as I, I, I read him as defining a polis functionally. A polis is... Whatever level of population and uh, and organization within that group, that's sufficient for people not merely to meet their needs and to make it into the next day, but also to um, to live a fully human life and to be able to flourish. And he thinks that there is a certain level of social organization and hierarchy um, that makes um, – you know, certain kinds of institutions possible. It makes it possible for us to uh, to create wealth so that we have time to devote to other kinds of pursuits and so on. And that that's the characteristic mode of human life is to live in that kind of way. Does he mean by the polis, does he mean the, the group of people, the community? Does he mean the state, the political organization? Does he mean both? That's a really good question. The, uh, the Greek word polis is ambiguous between those two things. On the one hand, uh, a polis could be a community, right? It could be a um, it could be a group of people. On the other hand, uh, a polis could be um, specifically um, a sort of government, right? Uh, what we would think of as well a, a political kind of organization, uh, and that that turns out to make a difference. And actually, in uh, in ancient Greek philosophy, different philosophers had. Uh, had a, had a different view of what the uh, of what the the fundamental mode of human life was, and some thought, well, actually, we need to distinguish political life from social life. Um, Aristotle himself is, I find, very unclear, and so I think that I'm not sure that he gets this distinction um, as 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 cleanly as I would, and I think that that leads to an unfortunate result. There's a couple of ways that we might have interpreted. Aristotle's insight about our being social creatures. Uh, we might have thought, well, that's interesting. So if if we have public policy so that we live better with it than without it, then here's how you think about that. Public policy should create a space in which society can happen, in which people can live in peace, they can pursue their interests uh, Without having to come in, into uh, into constant conflict or negotiation with other people, um, people should be able to experiment. Uh, there could be, therefore, a discovery process by which people uh, 
um, live differently and they share ideas and they communicate and they give advice and they pass down wisdom through the ages. And that's how we learn how to live better lives. Uh, but as far as the government is concerned, really its role is to fence that in, to protect it. Uh, it's more like a system of traffic lights rather than uh, someone who's actually telling the traffic where it should be going. Aristotle, however, went the other direction, and, and he thought that uh, our sociality involved, um, you know, the idea that, well, if public policy is for living uh, better with it than without it, then we need a full blown view of what it is to lead uh, of what it is to lead a good life, and then we need to design all of our institutions so that they constrain people's choices uh, from cradle to grave. Actually, for him, it it the process actually begins before the cradle, uh, uh, so that uh, we can guarantee as, as far as possible that that people will do the things that we uh, that we know according to this theory it takes uh, to live a, a flourishing human life. And I think it was unfortunate um, that uh, that he went that way rather rather than the former. And one of the reasons I think it's unfortunate is uh, the one that I was talking about a moment ago. There's this question of uh, not so much who has the best theory and therefore would make the deci best decisions if it were their decision to make. There's a more fundamental question of, well, whose, whose decisions are they to make in the first place? And what kind of reallocation of that decision-making jurisdiction can we really justify to each other? Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.